next speaker is Victor Farczyk, developer advocate at Atbound. Victor is a developer advocate, a member of the Google Developer Experts and Docker Captains Group, and a published author. His big passions are DevOps, containers, Kubernetes, microservices, continuous integration, delivery and deployment, and test-driven deployment. He will be talking about shifting left stateful applications in Kubernetes. Hello. Um, you already heard, my name is Victor. Um, I work for Upbound, and I'm going to talk about building platforms, right? Enabling developers to be self-sufficient, stopping, not doing any more what ops people typically do. Um, this is this is how I felt after I listened to Nicola's talk about monoliths, but we're not going to go there now. So I'm going to going to skip skip all the introduction and go straight into um, into my talk, actually a demo. So, uh, traditionally, the way how we work is that we are separated into different groups, and then one group knows how to write Java code, another group knows how to test, a th third group knows how to create clusters, a fourth group knows how to create uh, databases, manage databases, and all that stuff, right? And what is happening uh, is that typically we communicate with each other by opening Jira tickets, right? Everybody loves Jira tickets. Who is using Jira tickets here? Everybody. Excellent. I love you. Uh, just don't work in my company. Uh, <laughs> so typically what we do is, hey, I need a cluster. You open a Jira ticket. You, that Jira ticket is assigned to somebody. If you're lucky, you get it within a week. If you're not lucky, within three years. The same thing goes for databases and uh, defining applications, figuring out how to build something. Uh, deploying your application to production, right? Typically, it goes with Jira tickets or emails or Slack messages. If you're very young and funky, you might be opening uh, GitHub issues. Now, what we are trying to do is avoid all that, right? And that's the spirit of DevOps in a way, right? Now, I have a slightly different definition of what people, um, what DevOps is uh, than many others. From my perspective, DevOps is all about creating self-sufficient teams, right? You have a team of people, six, seven, eight, not more than that. More than that is a football match. Um, that is capable of delivering something from idea to production and making sure that it continues running in production, right? Having those self-sufficient teams that have all the experience and knowledge and tooling and everything to do all that from beginning to the end instead of going from one team to another, right? Now, the obvious problem with that is that that would mean that everybody needs to be expert in everything, which is impossible. And that's where uh, platform engineering comes in, right? So, uh, I'm going to show you one. Uh, I'm not going to go through slides much more. I like doing the live demos. So, I'm going to show very soon one possible way how we can uh, collaborate between those different teams. How can one team create a service so that other team can consume that service to get whatever they need uh, without opening Jira tickets, right? So the idea is to create tailor-made services uh, in a way that everybody can consume them, right? No matter how big of an expert somebody is in Kubernetes or AWS or whatever you're using. I know that nobody is using AWS here for a simple reason, because you would be in Las Vegas this week, right? Uh, <laughs> Uh, and also, I'm going to try to get to the point that uh, those services are documented automatically, so nobody writes wiki pages, and uh, ultimately, nobody has access to the system, right? Everything will be going through by pushing things to Git. Now, I might skip the Git part, uh, because that might take additional time, but we'll see how fast I can go. So, uh, what I'm going to do is um, try all that with a single stateful application that is connected to a database, right? Uh, and go, we're going to discuss what I need for that. Actually, I'm going to discuss it now. That's my next slide. So, uh, for me to run stateful application, one possible combination how I can do that is to uh, have a Kubernetes cluster. That's where my application will be running. I need a database server. 
Uh, I'm going to use AWS today, but the same logic applies wherever you're running it. Uh, I will, inside of that database server, I will need the database itself, and I will need a schema for, the, for that database, so some tables, whatever the, the cache needs. And I will need to figure out how I can develop that ap ap application effectively, easily, and how I can, if I have time, how I can deploy it to production, right? Uh, but that's the easiest part, uh, you'll see later, right? So that, that's, that's going to be my goal today. Uh, now from the tooling perspective, I will use exclusively open source. Uh, I will use Crossplane to create those services. Um, I will use Schema Hero to manage the schema of my, uh, of my database. And I will use Octeto for the development part itself. And a bit of bash scripting, nothing really special. So that's... that's uh, I promised probably that uh, I will have the least number of slides of everybody in this conference. So this, this is all I have, right? Uh, I'm going to st jump straight into a terminal and do the demo, right? And uh, then we can talk about it. Um, if you expected pretty colors, you know, and stuff like that, if you're scared from a terminal window, then you better leave now. You will not see anything than black and white. Uh, anyways, so the first thing I, I need to do in that hypothetical situation uh, for that application that I have, I need a cluster. So I need to create a Kubernetes cluster itself. Uh, and I will do that. Uh, do you see this? Is this big enough? Yell if it's not. A bit bigger. OK, that, that, that's the spirit. Say stop. OK, OK. There we go. Um, so I have a. Data clicker doesn't work, doesn't matter. Um, I have uh, here the definition of, of a cluster. Now, this does not come out of the box, right? This is me as an operator. I shouldn't touch this. Me as an operator or a person who understands Kubernetes defined extended Kubernetes, management Kubernetes cluster with something called cluster claim over there, right? So I'm creating a service that other people in my company can consume whenever somebody needs to create a cluster Define it yourself, right? Because all the complexities are hidden. That's what's running as operators in my cluster, right? So my, all my operational knowledge is codified and running in a cluster, and everybody else can just uh, define something like this, which is relatively straightforward. I want to define something called cluster claim. Uh, I have matching labels over there that says, I want my cluster to run in AWS, and I want it to be EKS, right? I have no idea how AWS works. I do not know, in, I did not spend 17 years of learning Kubernetes, but I know that I want it. Uh, and I know that I want it to run in AWS. And I'm defining a couple of parameters here, right? And now you need to think about it, the process. Uh, think that before this happened, when I as operator or sysadmin or DevOps or Bessary or whatever people, people call themselves, I spent some time talking with developers and said, what do you care about, right? Do you care about VPCs? Nobody does, right? Do you care about subnets? Nobody does. Do you care about the size of your servers? Yes, excellent. We're going to define a parameter. And then comes the question, do you understand what are the, the choices you have in AWS? No, excellent. We're going to have choices like easy, medium, uh, small, medium, large. And, we're going to, and you can define how many nodes you want to start with. And the most important thing, is that you will need to connect to that cluster somehow. You will need to run something in that cluster. So we should store the authentication in this secret, right? From there on, to your tools, your programs, your application, you yourself can fetch the information how to connect to that cluster, right? Now, uh, in real world, in, if I would have a talk focused on GitOps, or if I would be running this in production, I would not do what I'm about to do. So in the real world, in production, never do what I'm going to do now. And what I'm going to do now is execute QCuttl. Uh, namespace is A team. I want to apply something defined in example skates, AWS EKS. Uh, I think that this was the cluster, right? Now, don't do this for real in production, because in production, you will run Argo CD or Flux or Rancher Fleet. You will be pushing your stuff to Git. You will not have access to any part of the system. And those tools that I mentioned would synchronize. But this is not a talk about GitOps. This is the talk about uh, uh, creating services that enable people to do stuff and so on and so forth, right? Anyways, 
Now, I cheated a bit, right? Because it takes half an hour, give or take, to create everything in AWS. So I, I already executed that command before I jumped on the stage, but I executed the exactly the same command. So don't, those of you who are clever and read actually what's on the screen, don't freak out when that you see it unchanged, right? What does matter is that uh, I can show you the result of what I did. And now I'm a developer, right? Uh, I can go through the web UI of Argo CD or Fleet or whatever. I can just say, uh, give me all the cluster claims. And you can see here's my cluster. There's the name of the cluster. There's the control plane is active, node pool is active, it's synchronized, ready, right? This output, this is all customized, right? So none of those things come out of the box. I created, we call it uh, comp uh, compositions in crossplane. I created this output, I created this service, I created everything to be tailor made for, for my people. Anyways, um, so what else happened, right? I have a cluster now. So a cluster is up and running, trust me on that. Uh, now I need, next step is that I need, I need to be able to access that cluster. And I already mentioned before that, um, if you remember that definition, there was the last line said, store the authentication to the secret. And indeed, there is the secret with authentication, uh, how I can connect to my cluster, which is what I'm going to do. Uh, but since I would need to use JSON path and a few nested things, I'm going to simplify it with a silly uh, shell script that will just fetch the secret and store it in my kubeconfig file so that I can um, access it. TMA EKS. There we go. If it works, there we go. That's my connection uh, kubeconfig for my cluster. And I can prove it to you that I got the cluster in a very easy way. Uh, by saying kubeconfig uh, is uh, this one. And if I say kubectl get nodes, you can see the nodes of my new, new cluster that I faked that I created right now, but I created a couple of hours ago because it takes time. And there we go, three and a half hours ago, just around lunch or before. Anyways, I have a cluster. It was easy, no, I didn't need to open Jira ticket or I can do it myself. Um, and now the next question comes, uh, I have a cluster, uh, now I need a database server, right? I need a database server to run uh, that will later on be connected to my application, right? Now, uh, by the way, while I'm talking, uh, anybody knows what is required to run uh, EKS in AWS? Anybody tried? You need the Internet Gateway and VPCs and subnets and uh, EKS and a node group and uh, 70 odd, 75 other things. It's horrible. Anyways, um, so database, right? Um, here's another one, another service that I created. Or when I say service in this context, what I really mean is custom resource definitions. That's a way how you can extend Kubernetes to do whatever you want, right? And a corresponding controller that does the operational stuff. So if I would like uh, to run a database, uh, one of my options is this one. I can, uh, dear SRE in my company created something called SQL claim. All I have to do it is define it, say through labels that where I want to run it. In this case, I want to run it in the same Kubernetes cluster and I want it to be Postgres, couple of parameters, and as, 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 uh, as before, where I want to store the authentication to that database. Now, I'm not going to use this one because I'm not fond of running databases myself. I really honestly uh, l love the managed databases, so I'm going to define something almost the same. Now, this and this is almost the same, right? Same SQL claim, same everything. The implementation is completely different. How I'm going to run a database in Kubernetes and how I'm going to run it as RDS in AWS, completely different stories. But from the user perspective, from the perspective of everybody in my company, the only difference between this one and the previous one is that the labels. I'm saying I want the same thing, but in AWS, right? I'm making it easy for everybody and taking the burden on myself, how, how that will work in the background, right? So I want a database. How do I do it? Push it to Git, but I'm not doing it today. Um, now remember, before I was working in one cluster. Now I'm, now I'm actually not working in a cluster where I started. I'm now in the newly created cluster, right? Um, I want to apply whatever is defined 
in example SQL AWS. There we go, right? Come on. I think that this, what you see, remote Kubernetes server is unreachable. I think that this is something to do with the Wi Fi here. And I suspect that the last part of my demo will fail, but we'll see. Anyways, uh, again, cheating because it takes five to six minutes. You don't have that much time. I executed it earlier. But if I say, give me all the SQL claims, you can see that my database was created. Again, behind, you will see soon, actually. Behind this, I created a bunch of things, right? A lot of things are required to run database in AWS. But from the user perspective, it's very easy. It's one resource, and they will get it production ready, uh, tailor made to how we do it. Now, the next thing we need to do, I have a cluster, I have a database server, right? Now, inside of that database server, I need the database itself, and I need a schema, right? Um, and I'm going to continue with a similar, uh, similar approach. Uh, I'm going to first take a look whether I can access my database, get secrets. There should be a secret called uh, MyDB or something like that, eventually, maybe. There we go. There's MyDB. That's where I keep the authentication to that. To the database, I can connect to it. I can create a database. Uh, inside of that server, I can create the schema. I can do everything I need. Now, uh, get databases, PostgreSQL, uh, SQL Crossplane. I know it's handful, .io. Uh, the first part that I need a database, I already made a assumption as a provider of the service that whenever somebody says that I want SQL claim, I will create not only the server, but I will create the database itself. Uh, as long as the name of the database is the same as the name of the server, and you can see that my DB database inside of the server is up and running. So there's nothing for me to do, but I couldn't help directly to my fellow developers uh, to create the schema because schema will be different, right? Every application has a different schema. So I cannot do that in advance, but I can still help greatly by saying, um, here we go. Uh, Define something, uh, we're going to use Schema Hero. Schema Hero is an open source project that allows you to manage schemas uh, using Kubernetes uh, resources. And all you have to do is to define a table, to define columns that you want, and uh, above this is a definition of a database which essentially says, hey, go to this secret to get the, the password, right? So. The important part here is a table. Here are the, here are the fields you want. Everybody can, can learn this. It's not, you don't really need to know Postgres. Uh, all you have to do now is kubectl namespace dev apply whatever is defined in a file. Um, examples, SQL, uh, schema, hero, something, something, PostgreSQL, and params. That was the file, right? Uh, again, I would have pushed this to Git, but they did not install Argo CD today. Uh, so this goes to, the, goes to the cluster. Kubernetes will process that. It will figure out how to connect to the database. It will connect to the database. It will create the schema. And I will get the tables I need. And I can prove it to you by saying namespace is dev get tables schemas schemas and schema hero.io. Uh, and there we go. There we, soon. Probably, eventually. Maybe. Who knows? Demos fail eventually, always. There we go. The table is applied to the database. Uh, I'm managing the schema as part of my application from 36 uh, seconds ago. Now, the last part that I need to figure out is how I'm going to develop my application, how I'm going to write the code and compile it and do all those things. I'm not very fond of installing too many things on my laptop. I believe it's so much easier to run things remotely. It's so much easier to, uh, for somebody else to figure out how to create your development environment. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go now to a different directory 
This is my application. It's a fancy application. You can judge by the name that it's awesome. Um, and I'm, I'm going to switch now to the third project for today, which is called Octeto. Now, what we're doing in Octeto is uh, essentially doing three things. Defining how I want to build something, right? And I'm just saying over there in the build section, hey, I want you to build something called Silly Demo. The context is the current directory, whatever, wherever you are. And this is the image that I want you to build and push to my registry, in this case, Docker Hub. I want you to deploy uh, my application. And my application today is using customized. Doesn't matter. It could be Helm. It could be anything, right? Uh, just execute the command to deploy my application. And here comes the magical part, because you cannot just deploy application, because deploying application every time you make a code change would kill you. Uh, what we are going to do is deploy it in the same way as how I would run it in production, more or less, and then define the dev section and say, now go find the container that is part of that application and start synchronizing whatever is on your laptop into that container so you're developing directly inside of the application, running in a, in a cluster in the same way as it would run in production. And uh, to do that, uh, basically a specific couple of parameters, like uh, this is Go application. Uh, I will use bash to connect to it. Uh, I will synchronize the current directory. And I want to open a port 8080. Nothing really special. Uh, so all I have to do is say octeto up. And the namespace is dev, right? Everything open source today. Um, now this will take. Uh, a minute or two, depending on which image I used, it will probably need a minute or two. So how much time do I have? 13 minutes. Amazing. Oh, this is almost the end of my demo. I will get back to it when it's finished. Until then, uh, <coughs> I like to finish early so that you can ask as many questions as you want. Uh, I'll get back to it once it's running, but until then, this is that me, Abound, uh, Company, blah, 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 wherever, Crossplane, check it out, uh, Paradox, listen to it, uh, YouTube channel, uh, watch it. That's me. Now we're waiting for, the, for this to start. Any questions already? Where is, uh, where are you? Come, 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 come. <laughs> come, give me the questions. Well, we're waiting for this. You need to be effective, man. Run. You, you like to improvise, eh? <laughs> Do okay. it. I, I thought that after so many years ah, that you, I know I, you. I don't know who is attacking me. OK, you. Thank you. I want to give you this. Oh, this brilliant. Is from us. Not yet. I have to take, to take the questions first. Please, please, please. If what if they're not good? If you don't answer correctly, okay. Okay. I will take it back. OK. 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 So. I accept that, but not willingly. <laughs> Let's see the questions. How do you track costs when everybody can request new resources so easy? Great question. Now, that's the power of using Kubernetes and being able to extend Kubernetes. And that's pro the answer to the question is why Kubernetes wins. Kubernetes has the, not, not probably, it certainly has the biggest ecosystem we have right now, right? Uh, only if you look at the projects in CNCF ecosystem and then beyond that, uh, and what is important about the ecosystem is that no matter which tools you're using in Kubernetes, they're all made to work together through the API, right? So if you need to track costs, you should be able to relatively easily connect. In this case, I'm using Crossplane with the uh, cost, for example, project, and output the data and combine it together, right? And there was a second part of the question uh, how can somebody request resources so easily? No. Uh, in my case, because it's my cluster and I'm the only one using it, I can request it easily. In a real world situation, what you would do is two things. First, you would set their RBAC uh, and say, this team, this person, this floor in my building can access this namespace and can create, edit, or uh, read those types of resources. So, you can, you can run, uh, you can create cluster claim, I don't trust this guy in blue shirt, he cannot do it, right? So you define with Arbeck who can do what. 
And then you have another layer, pro, uh, which would be policies. I would normally use Kaverno is my preference. Mm -hmm. If you're a masochist, then OPI Gatekeeper is also a good option. Uh, and you would define uh, rules like, hey, this team can create only big servers and though this team can create only small servers, or whatever the rules are. So very easy in Kubernetes, after you figure out how it works. <laughs> Great. Okay, so there's another question. Uh, which is the difference between configuration and providers and how can it be combined? And the audience is on the other way. Okay, uh, so <laughs> can I assume that this is a question about configuration providers for cross-plane? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, so providers uh, give you uh, custom resource definitions that match one-to-one -one some real resources. So if you install provider for with, what was the previous talk? Azure, for example, right? Azure has some three, four, five hundred services. If you install provider, you would be extending uh, Kubernetes with the same number of uh, custom resource definitions as there are services uh, in, um, in Azure, right? Um, so providers give you a number of custom resources and a controller that knows how to speak with something. Azure, AWS, Google, VMware, whatever that is. And configuration, configuration is what I used. I did not want to go deep dive today. I can later if you want. Uh, essentially, uh, configuration is a way how to package compositions. Compositions are the extensions, extensions that you made. So for example, I used, I used provider for AWS today and for Kubernetes and for Helm, right? That's in my cluster. But then I combined some of the resources from there into something called cluster claim that created a cluster in AWS and installed applications in it and so on, so on and so forth, and another one. So compositions are the services you are creating and they are packaged into configurations. And we have more questions. Yeah! <laughs> In, you know, you will deserve this really when I give it to you. Yeah, okay. In test okay. VMware, who maintains all of these YAMLs? Uh, depends. Those that I've wrote, I maintain. Uh, so depends. Um, you. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know who maintains your YAMLs. Is it difficult to maintain that? So, uh, again, depends, right? Um, uh, so, Kubernetes, when you send some information to Kubernetes, you need to send it in YAML or JSON format. There is no way around it, right? Now, whether you write your YAMLs directly yourself or you use some of the tools, you can write your YAMLs with Pulumi. I, for example, the ones that you, I used for the demo today, I, I wrote them in Go with CDKs, right? Uh, you could be using YAM, uh, Helm, you could be using Customize, many different ways to do stuff. To write to manage your Kubernetes manifest. So you, you torture yourself with YAML, that's fine. Uh, and after all those years that we know each other, you made us stand here for 10 minutes for no reason. So I will continue roasting you with questions. So the and next one is, uh, what happens with the initial Kubernetes cluster? So you started with, I mean, you have the initial Kubernetes cluster that's building new Kubernetes clusters uh, from it. So why should I spin up resources just to spin up new resources? Is so I think of that initial Kubernetes cluster as a control plane, right? Uh, as a, you don't have to. You, you, I could have packaged everything in one cluster, no problem, right? And I could let that cluster manage itself with cross plane. So kind of, uh, that's not a problem. But if you go to a slightly bigger um, setup organization, uh, in majority of cases, people end up having one or more control planes and say, this is the place where I go to interact with my whole system, no matter which cluster it is and what's doing and whether it's something else like Lambdas or CosmoDBs or whatever kind of like central point, which we call control plane, that is beneficial for me because I have one point to interact with. And on the other hand, it is making sure that everything works. So that first cluster is more like a management cluster, control mm -hmm. plane. So you so have like a very minimal cluster with a low resource, and then you use that to spin up the other clusters afterwards. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, it can go deeper, depends. Like, uh, I would probably go with KCP, which is a Kubernetes that cannot do anything, not even run containers. Uh, uh, but that would be already too much. 
Okay. Well, great. Thank you so much. No, no, I have another question. Ah, I'm okay. not going to leave you. He, he, yes, he made us move you. up to the stage, so uh, I need to use this space now to, to ask more questions. Mm -hmm. And I have the, the hardest question. Does your demo work, or did you bring us to the stage because it didn't work after all? Change the screen. <laughs> Change the screen. Does your screen work? It does. That's the it real does. question. <laughs> there we go. OK, we so go. Walk I us am through what's happened here. I am inside of a container created next to the application running in my production cluster. There it is. You can see by a silly name. I would never have that name in my laptop. Really? And uh, I'm not sure about it. This is the this is the source code which was never deployed, but in this case was synchronized with uh, from my laptop to that container. And any change I make here would automatically appear there. And if I do something like uh, go run, first time it will need to download some libraries because I was lazy to put them uh, into the repo. And then it will run. So yes. So you know how to run Kubernetes clusters, but you don't know how to compile a Go server with Docker files? That's confusing. It's compiling. Oh, it's compiling now? OK, it's fine. Man. I'm just joking. Cool. He's going to make me suffer, I know. <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying my best. Uh, do you have more questions uh, from the audience, or uh, so that we let Victor uh, go down? I think okay. we're good. So thanks, thanks a lot, Victor, for that. And, uh, Thank you. Very much. And this is for you. Thank you.